Hello everyone, welcome to Talk Here with us last your favorite health program on television, reaching you from Nigeria's capital city, Abuja. My name is Dr. Laz Eze. 25th of November every year is commemorated internationally as International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And of course, it marks the beginning of 16 days of activism which is an international campaign that is done every year up to the 10th of December that is also International Human Rights Day. And during these 16 days, it's used by government, civil society organizations, individuals, different interested uh, persons and organizations to raise voices uh, against all forms of gender-based violence. Uh, data in Nigeria shows that gender-based violence has increased, especially over the last decade. Of course, the factors include a lot of violence as across the country, uh, whether it's the uh, terrorist attack in some parts of the country, the displacement, internally displaced persons, which are as a result of uh, violent attacks. Some, uh, like in recent times, the flood that affected Many states in the country have also displaced persons, and within those internally displaced camps, a lot of uh, people, especially women and young girls, are victims of different forms of uh, violence. The United Nations estimates that one out of three women in the world have at least encountered um, you know, gender-based violence. But when we talk about gender-based violence, it's not only women that are affected, but they are disproportionately affected. That's why it appears a lot of attention normally shifts to uh, women when uh, matters of gender-based violence is being discussed. So today on the program, I have a lot of guests, and uh, I'm going to be introducing them. The first segment will talk about gender-based violence issues, generally with an expert uh, who has huge experience, who herself had also been a victim at some point. You know, and in the second segment, we relate to sexual reproductive health and rights, adolescent health issues. And, you know, so it's a very short time, but we'll try to make the best use of it. Do stay with us. We'll be right back. Health Agenda 2023. The Nigerian health system is becoming weaker with the mass exodus of medical doctors, nurses, and other skilled health workers out of the country. In February and March 2023, Nigerians will go to the polls to elect the next president and state governors, respectively. This provides an opportunity for the election of leaders who will help to strengthen the health sector and reposition it to deliver quality healthcare services at all levels. We present to you Health Agenda 2023, an interview segment on this program for presidential and governorship candidates to discuss their health agenda before the electorates. For sponsorship and participation, reach out through any of the contact details displayed on your screen. Welcome back to Talk Here with Dr. Lars, your favorite health program on television. Yes, I have with me in the studio uh, Dorothy Njemanze. She's a development expert. Uh, she's one of those who started uh, this NGO, I think in 2020, uh, during the COVID-19 period where there was enough data that showed increase in gender-based violence, state of emergency, uh, GBV mm -hmm. in Nigeria, you know, she's lent her voices. She's also the executive director of Dorothy and Germanze Foundation. Now, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So, um, in the second segment, we'll be having a, a consultant community physician as well as uh, a fellow and young male advocate against GBV. I, I'm going to be introducing, introducing them further uh, during that segment. So uh, Dorothy is another period of 16 days of activism. Uh, I know sometimes uh, you've led this struggle for a very long period and sometimes you feel frustrated. So to those who are watching, can you uh, simply explain what issues around gender-based violence is in Nigeria, the different forms of violence being encountered by women and men as well, and of course, things that we need to do to curb it. 
Okay, Many thank questions you. in one. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. And they're all linked. They're very related. Thank you for having me on again. Um, with gender-based violence, it will be violence that is perpetrated against somebody on the basis of their gender. You know, so the gender is the primary reason why you're targeted for violence or why you are um, predisposed to being expected to accept or endure violence. Um, you mentioned something about it being disproportionately affecting women, and that's because of the patriarchal societies in which we um, live and the fact that a lot of people expect that the first woman in the room who decides to be um, heard or appreciated or accepted or you know outspoken should do those things after the last man in the room is tired of doing them. Um, look at it generally when you started school and everything you mm. know whenever you started school there were girls in your class and it means that however you progressed the girls in your class should have uh, expected to have been progressing uh, you know as much mm. so at that stage you some girls will come first amongst other things right um by the time you got to secondary school some girls start coming up with the stories of my my, my family decided to marry me off mm and you are continuing your education. Then you get to the university while your aspirations are, work, are working in tandem with building yourself to s make your dreams come true. Families are putting pressure on girls to get married. Hmm. Remember that the girls who started in primary school with you had aspirations also right. you know, in life. And so what became of those aspirations? Those are for the ones who family pressures into all of this. And why I brought family in now is, you know, to amplify the impact of socialization and right. how socialization into these um, harmful ideologies and perspectives, you know, makes a lot of people justify the amount of violence they predispose females to. And there are different kinds of things that females are predisposed to. There is... Um, um, a lot of physical violence, and the physical violence, of course, would include rape. The physical violence would include um, forced sterilization because <laughs> there's a lot of forced sterilizations going on. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, the female genital mutilations. That's very physical. The intimidations, the battery. Uh, yeah. Then there's a lot of things that work with playing on the emotions of survivors or of, of, of victims. Uh, Financial abuse largely borders on that. Mm. And it leans on the fact that people say, I am the man in this house, and as long as I'm the man, you will do what I want. So go and work and bring your money, and I will tell you how much of it I want you to have, when I want you to have, if I want you to have. Or I'm the man in the house. If you want to have access to your children, who you birthed through a labor process, mm. then what you're supposed to do is endure everything I come up with. And one of the things I'm coming up with is you cannot earn any money for yourself. So that anything you need, you're going to have to get it from me. You've captured different forms of gender-based violence, yes. uh, physical violence, uh, emotional or psychological violence, well. uh, sexual violence, economic uh, aspects of it. You know, so right now within the next uh, few minutes, what is, uh, have there been any form of improvement? Because for over the years, You've been very active, and I know so many other persons have been very active in this space, leading advocacy. Uh, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act was passed in 2015. I was involved in the last yes. year of the advocacy for that. Now over 30 states are said to have domesticated it. Yes. The Child Rights Act, additional states have, have also domesticated mm -hmm. it, even though by now, you know, you expect that all these states should have domesticated it. Mm. So, in the last decade, for instance, has Nigeria made any progress in this regard? Are there places things had gone worse? And what are your recommendations for us to, to move forward? Absolutely. There's a lot of progress that has been made. Now we're contextualizing things a lot better. Now there are better legal frameworks that are coming up. I mean, the VAP Act would be one of the... Um, uh, and new things that have come up, right? But right. Um, one of the retrogressions clearly would be that the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill hasn't seen the light of the day. And uh, I mean, what that seeks to achieve is a minimum of 35% of each gender at each important table. That's what that seeks to, um, uh, to, to, to achieve. Well, th there's, the national gen there's the National Action Plan, you know, the NAP, it exists now. And um, Th th there are just so many 
there's a, there's a lot more that has gone into coordination mm. now. So in what ways are the works of the police linked to the works of the Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Health, and all of that? So there's now right. better coordination. And the coordination is not just verbal. There are now standard operational protocols, Procedures. you okay. know, that are clearly defined. The police now has standard pro uh, operational protocols to uh, address uh, gender-based violence. And I learned they have a gender desk. In the oh, police, yes, there are now gender desks across board, amongst other things. But the question is, are they accessible? That's the number one question. Then the dynamics, again, to um, the manifestations of these problems and the realities of these problems. I keep saying something, nothing about us without us. For those of us who have survived violence, how are people listening to us? What exists now is mostly tokenist mm. in mm. nature. How are you listening to us to understand what we need? In response to sexual and gender-based violence, those of us who do the, uh, the frontline work you know, are not getting the needed support we should get from the government. And the needed support will be in terms of um, resources to do the responses and then cater to our well-being. Mm. I would have gone a little further to break down how um, the fact that the government, for instance, is play, playing with um, child marriage, for instance, with, with, with Kids Glove to show right. the impact. Because during the preparation for the continuous voter registration, one thing that we got reports of a lot was the fact that a lot of children were being impregnated mm. to be used to get uh, voter registration, among other things. And so there are a lot of links to this. I mean, this is, there's very little time, but there's a yeah. lot to say. So the act, uh, and recently this year, we had the issues around abortion guidelines, right. for instance. We'll, we'll be talking a, a bit more around that in the second segment. I mean, but it's very largely related. So for yeah. the children who were gotten pregnant, we could have used safe abortion guidelines, you know, to come to their rescue because now these people are trapped. There's no exit strategy to support survivors real time. You know, it's very, very linked. Sexual reproductive health and rights, everything, very, very, very linked. We very, should very, get to very, the very point, linked. we should get to the point where we... Um, we balance the things we want to do for survivors with the realities from survivors and impute from survivors because nothing about us without, without us. us. Thank again. you very much, Dorothy Jemaze, Dorothy Jemaze Foundation. Yes, thank you for having me. Keep doing your great works. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So uh, in the second segment, we're going to be linking, talking further around issues about uh, reproductive rights of victims of sexual, based, uh, sexual violence, which is a form of gender-based violence. Do stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Talking with Dr. Lazo Favorite Tales program on television. This second segment, I'll be having Dr. Oyedu Olaito. He's a consultant, public health, and community medicine physician, also a fellow of the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria, and a senior fellow at the Academy for Health Development ahead. He's joining us via Zoom. You're welcome to the program, Dr. O Olaito. Thank you for having me. Uh, good day, Dr. Lars, and to all the viewers. Thank you. Also with me in the studio is Mr. Zach Onwe. He's a women's sexual reproductive health and rights advocate. Incidentally, is the producer of this program and a health communications officer at Talk Health Niger. You're welcome, Zach. Thank you very much, sir. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Laito, um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Academy for Health Development, you know, had this training or, you know, or a meeting of fellows at Elife, and that was followed up with a program in Lagos, you know, and the issues were around promoting adolescent health, sexual reproductive health and rights, as well as family planning related issues. So during these 16 days of activism, how do you listen to Dorothy Njemanze, how do you relate issues of gender-based violence to what you are doing within the academy and working with the likes of Zags who are fellows uh, in, in your program? Thank you very much for um, the questions. And le let me just say that um, the Dorothy, in the first segment, actually nailed a number of issues on the head. Yes, we we're getting a lot of things right uh, regarding um, sexual reproductive health and rights, particularly uh, around gender-based violence, you know, in between some of the laws that we're trying to domesticate, including the VAP law, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Act. 
um, and the improved coordination. I know Dorothy also talked about the improved coordination among the agencies. But um, to draw a common thread uh, between what is happening within the um, um, sexual reproductive health and rights space, uh, I, I want I want to I want to spotlight uh, something we have done at the Academy for Health Development recently. Uh, while we're preparing for dissemination, a sneak peek is that earlier this year we did a national survey mm -hmm. on sexual and gender-based violence in Nigeria across um, thirteen sites, twelve states, and the FCT, um, just so that we can highlight what the issues are. Um, Interesting findings are that among sexual uh, and gender-based violence survivors, from our findings, um, about several, we, we talked to a lot of women, uh, we talked to 2,705 women across the country. Um, about 760 per thousand women had experienced sexual and gender-based, uh, had experienced some form of sexual violence. Now, what makes this perhaps a little more interesting is that of these women, about 121 of these women out of the 1,000 women we had spoken to had actually become pregnant as a result of the sexual violence they encountered. And the problem with this is that this further complicates their lives. There have been several, several other issues. Uh, but let me just quickly cone it down on some of the things that we have also discovered to be driving um, this. You know, there are cultural, economic, and social factors. But mm. when you look at some of our traditions and values, um, they support male aggressiveness and encourage a culture of silence. And this makes it very difficult for survivors to report cases of sexual violence. And let me quickly make a distinction here between um, victims and survivors. Survivors survive the event. I mean, they're alive to tell their story. A, a much sadder situation are the victims themselves who cannot, who are not even here to tell their stories. That is to show you how far um, um, sexual and gender-based violence can go uh, up to uh, women losing their lives. Right. But we, and um, so beyond the culture of violence, we also know that there are a lot of other socioeconomic factors like poverty that forces child labor and encourages um and exposes young children to all, all sorts of abuse. And of course, um, we have the peculiarities of um, insurgency in certain places, which is also increasing this. Right. Now, let me bring this all back to Dr. Um, Dr. Lito. Uh, contraceptive use. Yes, Dr. Lito, um, I, I think you've made a very good point, try to make these uh, linkages. Because of time constraints, I'll come back to you, but let me talk to uh, Zach uh, briefly in the studio. So Zach, um, when we talk about GBV, a lot of talks around women and uh, being disproportionately affected, and some critics have said that we are making too much, you know, making oh, yeah. mountain out of a molehill. Some persons are also like, oh, women, gender people are the ones driving this conversation, also ignoring men that are victims. So as a man, who is an advocate in this? What's your motivation and what roles do you think that young men like you, you know, need to play more in terms of checking this that um, the world, you know, the United Nations has kind of declared as what it sounds, the shadow pandemic of uh, gender-based violence? All right. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lars. Um, yes, one, one question I often get is, why is it that we are always talking about women, women, women? Is it that men are not being ab abused, right? So for me, as, as a young person who has been in this space advocating for the right of women, is because I feel that, yes, men are being abused, right? But the, when we talk about the number of men that are being abused compared to that of women, the, the, there is a larger gap. And, that, and that's one of the motivations that has been why I keep um, you know, advocating for women. I, uh, recently, I, 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 wrote a, I wrote a short story on Facebook, and it was about violence against women, and most especially on the issues of uh, female genital mutilation. Mm. So when I shared the story on my Facebook page, I, I was shocked too, because I've, I've just been hearing what people say, but I've not really seen people re relating to stories that has to do like... So right. pe yeah, so people were like, there, there were a lot of women who were like, this was what happened to me, this was what happened to me. So I feel that for me, these are some of the reasons we need to continue to 
say these things and speak it out there so that people will know that, yes, some of these things we are saying, we are not just making it up. These are realities of people's life, right? So it is something that when a, man is when a woman is advocating for a woman, it's a different case. But men are major perpetrators of this act. So as a man advocating for it, it, is, it speaks a very large volume for me. Thank so uh, some have argued that at young age, you should not just be talking to girls about how to dress, how not to dress. You should also be talking to boys, adolescent boys, on why they should not even attempt rape in the first place, whether as young people or as older people, or even why they should not force women, especially on issues that has to do with uh, sexual violence. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I, I think uh, raising, when, when we are raising our children, we should also all raise them not, we shouldn't look at gender roles. Mm. Which they should be raised as kids or as children in the family. Because some of these things, for instance, a lot of parents, they, they, they have specific roles that they give their, their boys try to do, and then they give the, 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 the girl child a specific role. So some of these things, they influence some of these actions as a child grow. But when a right. child is, you are raising up a child, and you are making that child to understand that, okay, as a boy, there is no specific role that is meant for you, and as a girl, there is no specific role that is meant for you. So you, you begin to learn earlier on time. Right. So when certain, when certain uh, actions begin to come up against um, something that or from your peers, you, you begin to remember how you were trained at home. So raising uh, up a child at the way that they should go is just is the best for me. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So let's get back to Dr. Light to con con you know, conclude this conversation. And Dr. Light, so you're an expert in this area. You've done a lot of activities and all of that. I know you have so much information to share, but unfortunately, we are constrained uh, by time. Uh, we have to round up in the next couple of minutes. So um, issues around reproductive rights, you mentioned that 121 persons, you know, who had sexual violence out of a, a thousand, you know, had pregnancies they didn't plan for. And when we talk about unplanned pregnancy, issues around uh, termination of pregnancy or abortion also come into play. And there's a lot of debates on whether in cases of uh, pregnancies arising from rape, you know, whether abortion should be an option or not. Uh, you know, you may not, there are like parallel lines with people having very strong beliefs on that. But from the professional perspective, what is your recommendation in this regard on especially persons, adolescents, who have uh, pregnancy as a result of sexual violence or rape? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that comes back full circle to the issue of um, contraception. One of the things that needs to be done quickly is to narrow the gap between reporting and response. I mean, uh, some of these on unplanned pregnancies could easily could easily have been averted by making sure that uh, both uh, survivors and providers have the right information about. Um, contraceptive availability and use, particularly modern contraceptive methods. Uh, beyond that, there, there, there also needs to be a policy push. I mean, there are several guidelines. You talked about the issue of um, the controversies around um, rape and abortion. Well, really, they, these are not controversies. I mean, there are several government there are several um, government guidelines, including the national guidelines on the safe termination of pregnancy, released. Um, just a uh, not too long ago, that is available to provide even guidance for uh, providers to ensure that they are working within the ambits of the law in terms of providing um, safe services for um, for survivors. Okay. So, in addition to that, the uh, just you mentioned earlier that the Academy for Health Development, partnering with the Gutmaka Institute, um, New York, USA. Um, did a dissemination activity on the 3rd of November um, um, this year, 2022. And one of the things we talked about was that uh, we referred to a lot of the data that already exists. I mean, data points to the fact that a lot of, sec even beyond sexual violence, a lot of um, young uh, people, particularly girls who are sexually active, or, or nearly half of them um, that want to use contraception, but they're not using it. What that tells us is that there needs to be increased awareness. We mm. need to bring in a multi-sectoral approach to it. We need to engage religious bodies. We need to engage um, cultural institutions. 
um, we need okay. to get more CSOs involved in um, in response. I know we already have people like um, Dorothy doing a lot, but we need we also need a lot more on right. board to ensure that this happens. And then finally, God, there needs to be a bigger push, not just on part of government, but even funders and um, right. well-meaning individuals to provide, um, should I say, the critical funding and infrastructure. Um, for this response. I mean, in, in several places across the country, we have um, sexual assault referral centers, the so-called SACs, that are available places for um, some of these, these um, survivors to um, go to. Okay. But beyond that, one of the things we talked about during the dissemination was the availability of a new tool called the Family Planning Investment Impact we're, Calculator. We're really what that does is that now, it helps you to on. know that um, if you invest in, uh, in contraception or family planning, uh, which is not just for couples anyway, you're actually able to gain more when you look at what you actually gain in terms of unplanned pregnancies that you prevent, um, or, and unnecessary abo unsafe abortions that are prevented, and the entire healthcare costs in general. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Oyedu Olain, so Senior Fellow at the Academy for Health Development. Thanks for joining us on this program. I'm sure there's so much to talk about. This is a very huge topic. Uh, we'll keep, you know, as much as we can, bringing experts to speak to this. And to you, Zach Onwe, thank you for coming to this side of the, <laughs> of the program today. And keep up your great works on promoting sexual reproductive health and rights. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Yes, that's all we can have on the program. I, I want to add that there is need for the states, state governments and local governments to do more in this regard. A lot of efforts and conversation has been largely at the national and international level. We need to do more. This is something that is serious, that affects the society in different ways. And let me also mention that development partners should do a good job. There is a, a safe space built at Government Secondary School of Mercy in a boy instead I went to and the job was very shabby. I used social media to draw attention to it. You know, I'm not sure if attention has been paid to it. Uh, so development partners who are spending resources has to do a very good job. And I commend all of them who are supporting the government of Nigeria to fight uh, this menace. My name is Dr. Lars Eze. Same station, same time next week. I look forward to seeing you. Bye for now.